Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondac webinar in association with Cooley, covering the modern product liability and adapting to the changing risks, risks for product manufacturers in the US and Europe. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm joined by a wonderful panel to take us through today's discussion. But before I do hand over to the panel to begin today's webinar, a housekeeping item. You can submit questions to our panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page. The panel will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session, but please do reach out after if any additional information is needed. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Rod to begin. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Dan, and, um, and welcome to everyone. Um, we're really pleased um, that you've been able to join us uh, and we're really pleased to be able to um, uh, uh, give this presentation on what we're calling uh, modern, modern product liability. Um, we have a fantastic panel um, for you. My, my, my um, fabulous colleagues uh, from, um, uh, from various parts of the world who are, who are part of our, our um, international products law team. Uh, as, as a team, we, we work together all the time on a daily basis. We're working shoulder to shoulder on, on um, issues for our, uh, for our clients. So it's, um, it's great fun for us to be able to um, and get together in this context and, um, and connect with you all as well. Um, as Dan mentioned, and thanks for the kind introduction, Dan, um, we are very happy to um, take, um, take questions. Uh, so please uh, use the chat function, and um, we really want this to be as interactive as possible. So don't be shy, um, and we'll um, we'll, we'll be more, more than happy to to tackle um, any questions. But we uh, we are certainly very pleased to um, be able to collaborate with Mondac to to um, deliver uh, to d deliver this, which is which is a bit of a first for Mondac actually, um, and and for us it's a it's a real um, um, indication that um, that. These issues around uh, product, uh, product regulation, product compliance, product liability um, are very much um, becoming bigger and bigger ticket items uh, for companies all around the world. Um, and you'll be hearing from um, uh, each member of our team on different aspects. Um, just by way of, way of introduction, um, you'll first hear from Emma Bichet. Emma, Emma's based in our, our Brussels office. Um, uh, um, Emma um, deals regularly on uh, with international issues, um, being in Brussels, um, a big focus on European issues, and Emma's very much uh, an ear to the ground, ear to the ground, and and feet on the floor as it were in Brussels uh, for our team in terms of um, what's happening uh, in that very important part of the world. Then we'll be crossing the Atlantic, and and you'll meet Sean Skolke. Uh, Sean's based in our Washington D.C. office, and um, Sean. Um, uh, amongst various other things, um, is um, uh, involved on a daily basis with issues with the Consumer Product Safety Commission, product safety issues uh, in the United States. He's extremely experienced, has a lot, a lot of insight, and I know you'll enjoy hearing from Sean. Um, then we're going to keep um, uh, keep travelling west um, and head to California, uh, where we'll hear from Bill O'Connor. Bill's in our San Diego office, um, and um, Bill spends uh, his time dealing with product liability litigation and, and related litigation issues. Uh, so we'll get some great insights uh, from Bill on what's happening uh, on that side of the Atlantic. Uh, we'll come back to London uh, to hear from Carol Holly. Um, um, uh, Carol is um, um, a very much a foundation member of our team here at Cooley, extremely experienced in handling um, international product safety, product compliance issues. And then we'll finish off with Claire, um, who many of you um, will already know, as, as with all of the others, um, and Claire um, handles all aspects of, of um, modern, modern product liability. In fact, it's, um, uh, she coined the phrase. Uh, so um, it'll be great to hear from Claire um, at the end of it. But just to start with, I mean, what we're going to try to do today is, is present a picture of, um, of what's going on in the world. Um, you know, try to do this in some respects at a fairly high level because there's there's a lot, um, a lot to talk about, and the world the world's a big place. Um, but there is a lot, um, a lot of things going on, and companies are feeling it. Um, or anyone who practices in this area. Um, knows that um, there is pretty much an unprecedented wave of, of reform and change happening at many, many levels um, uh, around the world. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we often reflect on what's driving this change. Why, why are we now seeing what is, is an unprecedented uh, level of, of change and adjustment and uh, increase in risks? And as, as we see it, we think there are um, uh, there are some sort of very discernible um, drivers of, of these changes um, around the world, in, in Europe, in the United States, and, and um, uh, in other parts of the world. Um, the first is um, is new technologies. 
um, that the certainly the regulators around the world have been fretting for a long time about whether existing well-established regulatory regimes um, have been fit for purpose when it comes to the challenges of connected products, artificial intelligence, um, 3D printing, uh, auto automated products. Um, and um, that has generated a lot of talk, a lot of talk at policy level uh, around whether, whether existing systems are fit for purpose. And as you start to look at what is behind a lot of the measures that we're seeing now, the changes that are being made, new technologies is front and centre in, in, in all of those things. Um, another area is an increased focus on the circular economy, on sustainability. And we're starting to see this uh, crossover very significantly into, um, uh, in, into uh, product regulation now and, and the perhaps a traditional distinction between product safety and environmental protection. Uh, that, um, that distinction is now, is now gone effectively and the policy, the, the policy approaches to product regulation uh, around the world are much more blurring, blurring those concepts and there's a lot of policy now around product safety and product regulation being driven from a sustainable, sustainability point of view. So you'll hear a bit more about uh, more about that. Um, we're also seeing um, uh, a greater focus on consumer rights. Uh, that consumer rights laws are being developed in, in some respects, led by Europe, uh, but we're also seeing real, what we call hotspots uh, in consumer rights around the world. Um, and it's the development of those rights uh, that that also impacts on the risk profile for companies. Uh, and alongside that, a much greater awareness um, uh, awareness amongst um, um, uh, consumer groups and, and, and communities about those rights and, and about expectations. Uh, so as we're seeing the world becoming a more and more connected place in so many ways, uh, it's that connectedness uh, between consumers around the world, the connectedness between regulators and the way in which they talk to each other and in some respects collaborate um, that's leading to um, this, this wave of reform that we're seeing around the world. Um, so we think it's very helpful to bear those things in mind that um, as we start to start to think about how to grapple with the changes and deal with deal with the details, having some awareness of why it's why it's happening, uh, I think helps us help us be better better prepared and better anticipate where all of this is headed and where we're all going to end up. Um, so, um, with those sort of general thoughts in mind, um, I'd love to hand over to Emma uh, to start to kick off our, our discussions. Um, and as I said, we're looking out for your questions as well. So um, let's make this collaborative. And over to you, Emma. Thanks, Ross, um, and thanks to everyone that's listening in for joining us today. So the title of my contribution, um, or what I was asked to speak about, is Turning Tides, the wave of regulatory reforms that are confronting product manufacturers in Europe. And just looking at that now, thinking maybe it should have been called something a bit more dramatic, like the tidal wave or the storm, um, just because there really is so much going on in the EU at the moment. And I think it's fair to say that our team here on the screen and the others who are not here um, have been collectively doing products law for a very, very long time, but we've never seen this level of change before. So where do we start? Um, I've tried to group the developments together into three big buckets, because as Rod said, we can identify a couple of common threads behind all the new product regulations that are coming out. So the first one is digital. The second one is green and the third one is enforcement and what I want to do today is just talk through some of the most important changes in each of these three areas. So if we start off talking about digital and I think just to take a step back in Europe there is a lot of political will at the moment to be the first mover in regulating the tech space and we saw that when President von der Leyen got appointed as the President of the European Commission, that was back in 2019. In her opening speech, she said, Europeans need to make sure that we shape our own approach to the digital world. And we really are seeing this playing out right now um, in a whole host of areas, with Europe taking a super proactive approach to regulating tech, and that's including in the products field. And I think even if you're not based in Europe, it is worth paying attention to this, um, to what's going on, because we do expect to see similar trends adopted elsewhere. So one big theme in products law is that we're increasingly seeing the EU trying to basically extend the reach of our product regulation to also cover software as well as hardware and more traditional tangible products. So we're seeing that in Cyber Resilience Act that was proposed by the Commission in September. 
and that's about new cybersecurity rules for connected hardware products, so things like mobile phones, but also embedded and standalone software, things like mobile apps. We're seeing similar trends in the proposed update to the Product Liability Directive, and that sets out the rules on strict liability for manufacturers of defective products. And what the Commission has proposed is to update these rules to make it easier for consumers to bring claims on one hand, but also to cover a broader range of products like software, connected devices and other types of new tech. Um, another interesting feature of that is that it covers new types of damage that we haven't seen covered before, such as data loss. And just lastly, before we move on, I think we can't talk about digital product regulation without mentioning the Artificial Intelligence Act. So this is an absolutely huge piece of legislation uh, that's been identified as a high priority for Europe, who considers itself very much leading the way in terms of regulating AI. It's being negotiated right now, but once it's adopted, it's likely to cover standalone AI systems, as well as AI when it's integrated into products. So just moving on to the second bucket of measures that we're seeing being adopted at the moment um, in the EU, that's called green. So <laughs> a big theme at the moment in Europe and also elsewhere in the world, I think it's fair to say, is that legislators are trying to align product safety law with their own national or international climate strategies. Um, this is partly because there's kind of a recognition that products manufacturing is ener energy intensive, it is resource intensive, and it's not always necessarily easy to refurbish or recycle products at the end of their lives. Um, so just uh, to give a couple of examples of that from the EU, as part of the Green Deal, that's the kind of environmental strategy that the EU has, the European Commission's announced a right to repair for consumers. And the idea behind that is that it's better for the environment to repair products rather than recycle them or throw them away at the end of their life. But obviously that does have impact on the safety of the product. Um, so in order to develop this right to repair, we've seen various pieces of new products legislation have been proposed. And one example of that, um, a recent example, is the new eco-design measures for mobile phones and tablets. They're going to require manufacturers to keep spare parts available for a certain amount of time after the product has been placed on the market and also provide repair instructions to end users and third parties, again, for a specific amount of time after the product has been placed on the market. Um, lastly, just before we go on to talk a little bit about enforcement in the EU, we're also seeing a big, big emphasis on increasing transparency about products to try to reduce greenwashing. So greenwashing refers to misleading claims about sustainability, about the durability of a product, or generally its environmental performance. Um, there's been quite a few new legislative proposals recently that are touching on greenwashing issues. And just to give one example of that, we have the Sustainable Products Regulation, which proposes to introduce what we call um, digital product passports. So these are passports that are accessible via QR codes on the label of the product or next to the product. And the idea is that that will give consumers, authorities and also NGOs um, information about the sustainability profile of the product. So it's not been completely defined yet, but we're expecting that to cover things like the carbon footprint of the product. And the idea is that if we have more transparency, uh, then that can be a tool to kind of cut down on greenwashing claims. So lastly, I wanted to talk just a little bit about enforcement in the EU. Um, as I've said, there really is a lot going on at the regulatory level and the EU has come out several times saying that they're keen for all these new laws to have teeth so that they actually mean something and they actually are enforced. You may have heard already um, this morning we had some big news, which is that the General Product Safety Regulation, which is going to update the General Product Safety Directive, has been agreed upon this morning. So that means there's political agreement and then the next step is a sort of formal rubber stamping and then publication in the EU official journal before it enters into law. Um, there's several reasons that this is being updated and one of them is to increase market surveillance and also enforcement. Now we've not seen the absolutely final text yet but based on what we've seen from the proposal and from the press reports 
for expecting mandatory requirements for reporting accidents um, or safety issues within quite tight deadlines and also stricter obligations for online marketplaces to reporting and also removing dangerous products from their platforms. And lastly, before I hand over to Sean, just in terms of enforcement, it's also worth mentioning the Representative Actions Directive. So this is a law that's already been adopted and it's going to apply from June 2023, so not too far off in about six months' time. Um, and we are really expecting this to revolutionise the way that enforcement takes place in Europe. It's going to introduce mechanisms to have sort of class action style litigation in all of the 27 EU member states. Now, quite a lot of the product laws that we've spoken about today will come within the scope of these re representative actions regimes. And so we do think that's going to have a huge impact on the way uh, product safety is enforced in Europe. And just with that, I want to now hand over to Sean, who's going to talk us through what are the trends that are happening on the other side of the pond in terms of CPSC enforcement. Great, thanks so much, Emma. Yeah, there's there's a number of important updates from the uh, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, I'll try to go through them at a high level in the limited time we have here. Uh, but if I had to put it into a few words, it's that this agency has become much more aggressive in terms of both rulemaking and enforcement. Uh, the CPSC now has a 3-1 Democratic majority with Commissioner Mary Boyle swearing in back in June, as well as Commissioner Bayoko's departure from the agency in October. Uh, we expect the agency to stay at a 3-1 Democratic majority for actually a significant period of time. Uh, and with that, the agency is likely to continue its aggressiveness push. So I've already used the term aggressive a few times. What, what do I mean when I say, you know, the agency is becoming more aggressive? Uh, it means a few things. So, so first, um, we're seeing an increase in CPSC uh, unilateral press releases. Uh, for years, uh, CPSC unilateral press releases were few and far between. And that's these press releases where CPSC comes out on their own and warns consumers about the dangers of a consumer product. They come out and they say, this product is dangerous. And, you know, this company, this manufacturer has not agreed to perform a recall. Um, you know, historically, T CPSC would, would rarely make these. Um, and you typically see them at the same time when the agency would file an administrative action to try to force a recall. However, you know, within the past year, we've seen a big uptick in the number of press releases that have been uh, announced. Uh, but we're not only seeing an increase in the actual published press releases um, that, that, you know, the public sees, but also we're seeing an increase um, in the number of threats, frankly, CPSC makes towards manufacturers that, you know, they go ahead and behind the scenes say, hey, you know, we're going to send out this press release uh, if you don't agree to perform um, a recall. So, uh, you know, we, we believe these unilateral press releases are a thing that are here uh, to stay, um, and we're just going to be seeing more uh, and more of them. The second thing we're seeing um, is an increase uh, in pressure on retailers to conduct recalls. Um, the agency is increasingly working with retailers where manufacturers are declining to perform voluntary recalls. Uh, rather than continuing to get into a fight with manufacturers, um, the CPSC knows that they can lean on the sellers of these products to perform recalls. You know, retailers may have less skin in the game when it comes to existing inventory. Uh, retailers' contracts often require reimbursement from manufacturers for product recalls. And for those reasons, retailers, they just may be more apt to perform recalls when manufacturers refuse to do so. CPSC does have jurisdiction over both manufacturers and retailers alike. And for that reason, CPSC will continue to exploit that to pressure manufacturers to perform those recalls. Essentially, they'll say to, to the manufacturers, hey, if you all are not going to do the recall, we'll just go to your retailers and see if we can get them to do it. So that's the second way um, the agency um, is becoming more aggressive. A third thing we're seeing is an increased focus on recall effectiveness. 
Uh, the CPSC is seeing themselves an increased pressure from Congress regarding what it believes to be low recall participation rates. Um, to fight this, CPSC is requiring recalling companies to take a number of steps aimed at increasing recall participation. They want consumers to send back um, more and more of their recalled products. Uh, and so to, to, to get better recall participation, they'd like companies to do a few things. The first is um, they want companies to post multiple times to multiple different social media platforms. So historically, recalling companies could post potentially once to each of Twitter and Facebook, maybe Instagram, um, if they had it. Now CPSC is looking for companies to post you know, a few times the first week of the recall, and then maybe once a week thereafter for the first month. Really try to get the word out to consumers about product recalls. The second thing is directly notifying um, known purchasers at least two times. So instead of just sending that email um, to consumers, hey, you've purchased a recalled product, um, and then walking away from it, CPSC is now requesting at least two notices. Um, if a consumer does not participate in the recall after the first notice, um, approximately two weeks later, the CPSC will insist a second notice go out the door. The third is the CPSC wants um, recalling companies to notify third-party e-commerce platforms and resellers about recalls. Um, they want these platforms to go ahead and notify their known purchasers, as well as um, they want recalling companies to monitor those third-party sites uh, to, to request that, that recalled products not be sold there. So for example, if you're a recalling company, um, CPSC wants you to, for example, um, take a look on eBay and say, hey, it looks like our recalled product is being uh, sold there. We need to go ahead and immediately notify them to take that listing down. CPSC is also kind of piloting some new things. In terms of direct notification, in some contexts, uh, they are uh, asking companies to send text messages to known purchasers. Uh, so it's no longer just emails or hard copy letters to notify uh, consumers that their products have been recalled, but you know, they, they may be requiring text messages as another way of getting the word out. And then finally, and, and you know, I, I think, in my opinion, most aggressive, um, CPSC um, has been uh, potentially requesting that recalling companies do paid advertising of their, re, uh, of their recall. So rather than just the quote unquote free, um, you know, social media and website postings, CPSC is increasingly requesting um, paid advertising be done um, to get the word out. Uh, finally, the agency is looking to require publication of recall participation statistics. Um, they've done this for a number of years, uh, but they're really ramping up uh, their, their abilities and their willingness to publish this information. The next thing, and, and perhaps one of the most important ways that we can see that CPSC is, is getting a little bit more aggressive here, um, is that uh, there's an increased focus on civil penalties. Thus far in 2022, there have been five civil penalties announced ranging from five to $13 million. This is in comparison to only one civil penalty in 2021, none in 2020, two in 2019, and one in 2018. So we can immediately see that this agency is focused on using civil penalties as a deterrent uh, and we'll use these civil penalties to send a message to the regulated community. Uh, there have been a multiple statements from CPSC commissioners to make clear that the agency is looking to increase the frequency and the amount in terms of dollars of civil penalties. These statements um, have included words that, that note the agency's $17 million cap on civil penalties is insufficient to actually work as a deterrent. Some statements have noted that a $17 million penalty may actually just be seen as a cost of doing business, a parking ticket, or a minor inconvenience for large companies whose revenues may be in the you know, billions of dollars. So we see there's um, an increased focus on increasing the amount of civil penalties surely, um, and we do expect these civil penalties to increase both uh, in, the, in the number uh, that are um, that, that, are, that are being publicly announced, as well as the dollar amounts. 
Uh, finally, the agency's announced its willingness to work alongside the Department of Justice uh, for referrals to the agency for investigation. Um, this goes to potential criminal conduct relating to companies' failure to report product safety issues uh, in a timely manner. So that's a whole lot um, that, that we tried to jam pack into just a few minutes. Um, I'll now hand it over to, to Bill O'Connor to stick in the United States and talk about some class action litigation, product liability litigation trends. Uh, thanks, Sean, and um, it's good to be here um, as part of this presentation. Um, I'm gonna focus on the uh, liability part of the equation, which really does fit in hand and glove with what we're seeing as far as the trends on the product safety and, and regulatory uh, side of the equation that Sean covered. Um, just like we're seeing there, um, the increased liability risk in the US is, is growing and as broad as ever. Um, I think the headline from my perspective uh, of uh, a lawyer spends the majority of his time defending uh, product manufacturers in um, product liability litigation in the United States and abroad is that our courts are uh, certainly open for business. Um, there's been a lot of activity over the last couple of years in the product liability area and uh, the bottom line is um, it is a significant business risk um, for, for all of our clients and it's getting um, even more significant um, by, by the day. This is manifesting um, in, in a number of ways. Um, first, um, since the courts have reopened over the last couple of years in 2021 and um, 2022, um, there's been an increase in the number of very large verdicts, um, nuclear type verdicts, um, eight figure plus um, awards um, that just based on uh, anecdotal evidence, talking with clients and, and seeing the reports of these verdicts coming in um, are coming in at a higher frequency in a much higher amount. Um, a lot of discussion around the reason for that. Um, uh, and a lot of different theories, but the bottom line is it's certainly happening and it's happening across a broad range of, of products. Um, what we're also seeing on the litigation front is uh, increased exposure to our clients from acquired liability through uh, M&A transactions. So this would be a product line acquired um, from others that tends to um, perhaps at the time of the acquisition doesn't really present itself as a serious risk, but does become one over time. Um, there's also just fundamentally um, an explosion in the number of mass tort cases that are currently pending in the United States throughout the country. Um, this is especially in those cases that are centralized in our multi-district litigation process. Uh, in the federal courts and then also through uh, coordinated state proceedings that are um, managing through a number of uh, procedural mechanisms a very large um, number uh, of claimants. The, the number of plaintiffs involved in these uh, coordinated mass tort cases is at its highest level ever um, and the result of that is the stakes are higher um, than, than they've ever been. Another trend on the litigation front has been um, the uh, deployment of very sophisticated means from the plaintiff's bar um, through social media and other avenues to uh, aggregate their clients, um, which then results in the, just the, the, the number and increase in the, in the claims. Um, and finally, and I'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail, um, another trend that we're seeing is the testing uh, of the bounds of new product liability theories. Um, and this has to do with um, the product versus service distinction um, that has been sort of a, a traditional dividing line in product liability law that is starting to become blurred. Um, and the eroding of certain immunities for online content providers uh, especially in the area of youth addiction 
and um, social media services and, and applications. And all, all of this tends to lead to uh, increased risk uh, of liability to manufacturers at unprecedented levels. Um, the cost of business is uh, already increasing due to inflation and supply chain pressure. And we may see some easing of those uh, pressures in the future, but the liability cost will, I believe, remain for quite some time and really unseen in terms of what the what the overall risk and exposure um, should be. Um, coming back to the verdict issue, um, one thing to note, typically um, there's been certain very plaintiff friendly jurisdictions in the United States where it, it wouldn't come as a surprise to most product liability litigators that the amounts are so high um, or that the liability determination on what would appear to be slim evidence of a defect or causation, that there was liability uh, nonetheless found in certain uh, hotspots throughout the country. Um, one of the things that we're noticing is um, there's less concentration of those nuclear type verdicts in certain jurisdictions. They seem to be spreading um, throughout the country to jurisdictions that you wouldn't typically think of for uh, high awards and uh, findings of liability on uh, slim evidence or the absence of, of causation. The takeaway for, for, for that, from, from my perspective at least, is that counsel's um, greater caution at the early stage of cases that we handle, um, making strategic decisions um, in, in light of this new paradigm, um, and just uh, absorbing the reality that cases are more expensive um, to both defend and manage and then ultimately resolve through either verdict or uh, settlement. Um, on, on the M&A activity front, um, given the increased exposure that we're seeing there from products acquired from other companies, um, one lesson learned would be um, more rigor during the due diligence process. Um, the cost of a recall or a major liability issue from an acquired product can almost overnight wipe out the value of that transaction. So that counsels getting litigators involved in the acquisition process and product safety lawyers to understand product history uh, to avoid that type of, of risk. And then um, on the number of cases that we're seeing that are proceeding through the mass tort um, system, either through an MDL, multi-district litigation, or through through the various state court cases, is that defendants are starting to lose the benefits of uh, the efficiency of centralizing those cases and, and managing them. It's become more and more a all or nothing proposition where uh, the defense um, has to win uh, every issue, whether it be liability, uh, causation or establishing a range of um, reasonable damages awards through bellwether trials. My opinion is that over time it's become actually harder to settle those cases once they become centralized in some, um, some form or fashion. Now it's not always possible to avoid centralization of course but um, some of the benefits um, when cases were smaller, fewer claimants, although had several common issues, are becoming harder uh, and harder to settle. Um, the marketing by plaintiff's lawyers is also, in my opinion, making cases harder um, to resolve as well. Um, you have um, uh, an increase in the number of cases that are um, controlled by fewer and fewer law firms. And so, it becomes harder to implement strategies to try to resolve uh, cases when the uh, lawyers on the other side have more leverage vis-a-vis -vis just the number of cases that they uh, ultimately control. And so that is becoming uh, a, a difficult issue um, to, to try to solve for when approaching um, a mass liability type situation. Um, and then finally, the last trend is on this new line of cases that I mentioned that's testing the boundaries of, of product liability 
um, law, and that has to do with questions of duty. How far uh, does the duty extend uh, if you're not the actual content creator? Um, and also, what is the definition of defect in uh, some of these um, newer innovative products um, when you have aspects of, of, of a product and a service and when you're also a, a content provider and of course causation. Um, when you get into issues of addiction and mental health um, on certain products, um, it becomes a very difficult question in terms to how to address and, and establish causation. And I think we're going to see um, a whole new sort of um, a construct of what the law requires um, for these types of products that'll take some years to develop and will be constantly um, changing uh, over time. So um, if I had one uh, message um, for people who are attending and, and, and trying to absorb a lot of content in, in a short amount of time on, on my area is um, call your product liability litigator early. Don't don't necessarily wait until a lawsuit gets filed. Um, talk with them about ways to mitigate some of these risks earlier on um, so we can bring some of these um, observations and lessons learned from matters that we've dealt with in the past to, to help mitigate some of these risks before it's too late. Um, so I'll turn it over now to uh, Carol to pick up on that theme and um, talk about what we're seeing as far as new developments in, in her area. Thanks. Um, so before I kind of launch into the various points that I'm going to try and cover uh, in the next six or seven minutes, I just wanted to briefly set the scene and reorientate ourselves. Now we're all back on this side of the pond so you have a sense of what I'm going to be uh, talking about. And so what I'm going to try and do in this section is give you a sense of the range and the level of change we're seeing at European um, in the European landscape now, as this relates to kind of three interlinked but very important concepts being safety, compliance and responsibility. So I'll touch on each in turn and, and give you a bit of an overview and, and an example or two for each. But I hope you'll forgive me. I will first start with a very brief lawyerly caveat that um, this is going to be a bit of a gallop through some really big topics. Um, we just want to give you a sense of the breadth of the change. And in addition, as, as Emma kind of flagged, this is really a moving picture. And lots of what I'll touch on is relating to legislation that's going through the legislative process. So we've got an indication of the direction of travel, but we don't necessarily have all the answers quite yet. So first taking this concept of safety, this is one that I expect everyone here um, to consider themselves some sort of an expert in, if not in your day-to-day -day professional life, at least in what you would expect as a consumer of products. And the reason that this concept matters is because it's a requirement for selling products um, in the UK and the EU and, and really every country in which you might be selling a product. But it's also important because a safety issue, a product that's not safe or posing risk, will generally trigger an obligation to inform regulators and take other action in respect of that product. And our understanding and our expectations of safety have been shifting, uh, in part due to huge technological developments that um, Rod mentioned. So that's both from a practical perspective as well as a regulatory one. The question is really becoming what we understand by safety and what can and should we be taking into account when evaluating whether or not a product is safe. And so I'm going to come back to the, um, the legislation that Emma mentioned that was agreed at a European level today, um, the General Product Safety Regulation. Uh, this is very much hot off the press and we don't yet have the final text, but based on what we've seen throughout the legislative process, we're expecting a much more pres prescriptive but also broad indication of the sorts of factors that will have to be taken into account when evaluating and determining whether or not a product is safe. So, for example, uh, we're expecting to see quite a prescriptive list of um, various different factors. So expecting emphasis on implications for safety where a product is connected. That's something we anticipate being quite difficult to determine before a product is made avail available on the market because of course so much can change when it interacts with other products later. Um, we expect to see specific consideration being given to persons with disabilities as the category of user of a product. Um, in, and in particular, we're also expecting changes around 
um, cybersecurity features, um, the evolution or learning functionalities of a product, so kind of touching on those AI features as well. All of that going into a big melting pot of what we need to think about when we're determining whether or not a product is safe. There are also examples of the broadening of the concept of safety in the Draft AI Act, which Emma also mentioned, as well as under a delegated act under the Radio Equipment Directive. And I mentioned both of those because it's really important to see that these changes are happening in existing legislation, existing regimes, as well as in new legislation that's, um, that's under development. And the really key point to take away here is that broadening of the concept, and it's getting more complex. And that really matters because this is such a critical requirement, both upfront when you're looking to place a product on the market, and also what you have to do if, if something goes wrong and what you need to think about. But as you all know, safety is only one element of compliance. There's a whole host of other things that you need to do upfront in order to make sure that you can lawfully sell a product in, uh, in Europe. And again, these requirements are changing and they are changing quickly. Some of these relate to um, examples like Emma mentioned in relation to the environment. Another example is um, the revision of the batteries directive, which is um, developing proposals amongst other things in relation to batteries being readily removable and replaceable. One of the things from my perspective that I think is really critical is the different approach that's now being taken to the CE marking regime and new concepts um, and pieces of legislation that are being added to the CE marking legislation. Um, the CE mark, for those of you who are not so familiar with it, is the compliance mark that a manufacturer applies to a product to declare compliance with the laws and standards that kind of require the CE mark. So it's a bit circular, but it's a really critical um, foundation of the European regime. And a couple of examples of, of new legislation that's seeking to require the CE mark um, is, the, again, the AI Act. So that's specifically addressing providers of high-risk AI systems. That's going to require CE marking. And also, um, interestingly, the new European Accessibility Act, which is bringing accessibility requirements into the um, CE marking regime. So that's not going to cover all products, but it, it's going to cover quite a lot of important ones for the European market. And at the minute, there's not a whole lot of detail about exactly what those accessibility requirements are going to look like, because the harmonised standards, which will really put the meat on the bones, haven't yet been published. So again, there's a lot of fast paced development there and a lot to be on top of. And practically, there's, you know, there's not often the long lead, lead times that manufacturers of products need um, in order to implement the necessary design changes. Um, and of course, the devil can be in the detail of those harmonized standards, which aren't always available um, immediately. And then finally, I just want to turn to touch on changes in the concept of responsibility. And this is a really critical piece of the jigsaw puzzle because it tracks back to who has to do what and when. And changes in this area have really been driven by the, the, the kind of usurping of the traditional supply chain and the rise of online sales. So there's, a, again, lots of um, moving pieces here, but the European Union adopted in 2021 some legislation that um, brings in fulfillment service providers into having responsibility for certain products um, to, again, these CE marking products typically in the supply chain where there's not otherwise an EU based economic operator. And that's fascinating because that's the addition of responsibility for someone in the supply chain that had never had responsibility before. Similarly, there's a real shift in how online marketplaces are being um, treated in the legislation. So the General Product Safety Directive is introducing new requirements. Um, again, exact details to be confirmed when we see the final legislation, but we're expecting to see um, requirements that allow consumers to notify the online marketplace of unsafe products, um, as well as strict time periods for taking down listings of unsafe products. Um, there's a lot going on in this space, so I'll very briefly mention that when combined with things like the new Digital Services Act and also the Representative Actions Directive in the EU, there is the potential for enormous impact on these online marketplaces. And you might think that these changes aren't relevant for you if you, unless you're an online marketplace, but I'd really challenge you to think of it again about that. And the reason for that is that in allocating responsibilities to different actors in the supply chain who hadn't previously had those responsibilities, we're potentially seeing the dawn almost of KSI regulators because where the liabilities that weren't there before are now on these actors, they are likely to, you're likely to see that they can 
will be taking down products. They will be potentially um, taking actions that make it more difficult, create more friction in the supply chain. And so that can have a, vast, a kind of a really vast impact um, where you wouldn't have necessarily seen that before. I suspect I'm now either out of time or over, and I apologize both for the speed and the, um, the high level nature of that update. We're really happy to answer questions, but I will now pause for breath and I will hand over to Claire. Thank you very much, Carol. And just a further plug to say, there is time for Q&A at the end. Feel free to put your questions in and we'll try and get to those. And I can rattle through my section to make sure we've got more time to hear from yourselves and what's on your mind. So for our last section, Bearing in mind everything that we've just heard and acknowledging that there is an enormous amount that product manufacturers and distributors and retailers are having to grapple with in terms of modern product liability, we wanted to look at some practical solutions for how best to go about managing these emerging challenges. Now, there is no one way of doing this. I'm afraid we can't give you a blueprint, but we hope that some of the following will provide you with food for thought and be helpful to help you navigate these increasingly turbulent waters. You can start this process in a number of ways, but for us, we think it is critical to understand your business. That's what we do with all of our clients. So what's the business model? What products and services are you dealing with? Which countries do you operate in? Which countries are you sourcing products from? And who are you supplying to? Consumers, other businesses, how are you supplying them? E-commerce, marketplaces, bricks and mortar, retail stores. It's important to understand your business because that's going to help you effectively triage all of the different issues that are crossing your desk. Timber regulations aren't going to be important to you if you're a medical device software developer, but they are going to be if you manufacture furniture. Equally, cyber resilience requirements matter significantly if you supply and develop IoT devices, but perhaps not so much if you're producing food and beverages. It'll be a continuous process because businesses change. They can be acquisitive, they can divest, move countries, expand and contract. And all of those therefore impact what risks are relevant and also no longer relevant. Once you understand your business, that puts you in a position to more effectively move to what we see as being the next stage of managing risk. And we think this can be looked at in two parts. So firstly, being cognizant of the current risks that are relevant right now. So that's the current landscape that you're in. What's the regulatory landscape you operate in and, and currently applies? Do you understand that for all countries that you operate in? Who are your key regulators? And what are your relationships like with those regulators? Do they know you? Why do they know you? Do you have experience of collaborating with them? Or are you on their radar for previous compliance issues? What about ongoing litigation uh, that you might have in certain countries or, or wider litigation uh, that other similar businesses are experiencing? It, it's really important to learn from others. Don't just wait for the learnings to happen to yourself, but look at what others are doing and what others are experiencing and learn from them. Your consumer complaints, how are these monitored? Do you have a way of ensuring that serious issues and themes are picked up and acted on, being dealt with consistently and escalated appropriately? What about your reports from quality control and quality checks? media reports, wider industry issues, and also enforcement trends, which we've talked about quite a bit today. Collectively, when you put all of these different areas together, that can help you build your current risk profile. But the second part of this is horizon spotting. You may well know where you are right now, but in terms of what's coming down the line, without a doubt, this is probably one of the most challenging areas to address as a business, because as you've heard today, there is such a lot happening in terms of new legislation, new policy, enforcement, increased litigation risk, and it's a lot to stay on top of, especially when you get new areas of regulation that we've not had before, um, and also the rates that it is emerging at. Failure to be across these risks of itself risks failing to protect the value in your businesses. So if a new area of regulation emerges, such as AI or cyber resilience, and your business relies on those technologies as part of your product offering, you might need to know how potentially to change, because it might impact the way that your product is designed, how it's manufactured, how it's marketed. It might introduce new concepts, new obligations, new concepts of risks. It may even make your product, your offering, illegal. Specific to regulation and policy, Failure to be across these also means that you could be missing out on the opportunity to be involved in the development of them. For example, the EU takes a consultative approach to developing legislation, providing opportunity for feedback at certain points, and being able to feedback at certain points can be instrumental into how that legislation is developed. 
Scanning the horizon can seem overwhelming, even for the largest of organisations. Um, we have people here at Cooley who are dedicated to it, and we know firsthand how challenging it is, but there are things that you can do to help. And genuinely, these are the things that we practically employ within our own business, within our products team. Identify helpful resources. That could be blogs, it could be law firm blogs. Some of these blogs might be behind a paywall and it might well be worth paying for that paywall to get to that information. Government websites, friendly lawyers that will share information, friendly regulators, friendly academics, all potential sources of information. Attend, I was about to say attend conferences, attend relevant conferences. There are certain organisations out there that put on conferences which can be really helpful melting pots of information and can help you make really valuable connections in this area. Regulator engagement is really important and you'll see that certain regulators can be brilliant with how they engage with businesses. Um, the UK Product Safety Regulator, OPSS, does something called Business Reference Panel, which is fantastic. It's where businesses can go along, talk directly to the regulator and ask lots of questions. Uh, regulator websites can be helpful sources of information. So the CPSC will publish information about particular product safety risks they see, particular products that are recalling. Uh, the European Commission has the EU Safety Gate, which can help you identify products which are being recalled and can help you identify trends. You can set up litigation alerts. You can see reports on enforcement trends. Also, we'd urge you to look at your partnerships with people. So that might be with law firms. We often visit clients and tell them what's on the horizon. It might be the trade organisations and trade bodies that you're members of. Are you getting information from them? How about within your organisation, perhaps your regulatory affairs team, perhaps the engineers, perhaps people on the board? Also, consider tasking people with responsibility and empower them. Who in the business can report back to you on these issues? Who can run point? There will be certain people in the business who are really passionate about this. They might be particularly passionate about health and safety, might be very passionate about ESG. Take those passions and empower them to be all over these potential areas of risk. But once you have this information, what do you do with it? We talked about this being a tsunami or a tidal wave. So it's just as important that when you get this information, you have a process to quickly establish whether or not the areas of risk that you're seeing need immediate attention, monitoring, no attention. Are they relevant to all of the business or just part of the business? No one size fits all for how you're going to go about this, but ensuring that you triage and disseminate the information about risk is important to ensuring that they'll be addressed. Finally, have processes and procedures in place to make sure that this is part of the day-to-day -day fabric of your business, because it is all well and good setting up these processes but not staying on top of them and not making them part and parcel of how you operate means that they just will fail to pick up the information that you need. I should also say on the helpful resources point, as one final plug for us, we have a uh, blog called Clearly, Clearly Product Wise. And if you sign up to that, you will receive timely alerts about new areas of litigation and policy that we make sure we stay on top of. Now, I rattled through that because I really wanted to move on to some of the Q&A and we've had a couple of quest, uh, questions that have come through. Um, the first one of these, actually, I'm going to turn to Rod first and then uh, then to Sean, which is, are there any significant differences in third party testing standards between European countries and the US? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question and, um, and yeah, thanks for um, thanks for asking it. Um, I'll hand over to Sean in a moment to um, um, sort of get a, a, sort of a few views on the US position. But I, mean, I think part of the answer is uh, to understand that from a regulatory perspective, the US and Europe come from very different um, traditions and, and have a very different approach to, to product regulation. Um, so product regulation in Europe is very much structured around the, um, the, heavy, the very heavy use of, of industry -led standards. Um, which, um, uh, whilst not exactly um, part of the law, are very much sort of embedded embedded in the law. So the European regulation does rely upon um, standards um, to complete the regulatory picture, perhaps in a way that most other parts of the world don't, except to the extent that they, they follow uh, the European lead. Uh, so we do see certainly some sectors where, um, you know, where mandatory third-party testing is required, um, other, others where it's not. Um, but in terms of in terms of the expectations, we do see yeah, quite often a lot of um, difference between the U.S. approach to compliance um, and responsibility for compliance and the approach that's typically 
uh, typically taken in, in Europe. Uh, so there's no, no sort of one, one size fits all answer to the question, but it is, it is, a, it is a great question and, and can give rise to frustration for manufacturers. But I'll hand over to Sean um, for a, a US perspective on that. Yeah, from the U.S. perspective, you know, the CPSC views voluntary industry third-party standards that they haven't adopted as almost like a minimum floor, but not sufficient to avoid recalls. So the CPSC views them as instructive. They, of course, want to make sure that companies are testing their products to a standard, and industry and third-party standards are, are important. They're helpful for setting that minimum baseline. However, that doesn't mean they won't take action against the product that does fulfill the requirements of that third-party standard. So um, they, are, they are instructive, they are helpful, but generally speaking, if the agency hasn't adopted that standard as mandatory, um, it, it's really just that, it's really just an instructive standard, um, which, which does, to an extent really, really differ from the EU. And it, it also differs um, from product to product as well. Fantastic, thank you very much, Sean and Rod. Um, another question that we've had in um, is, how can a small US manufacturer looking to expand into the UK EU markets keep up to speed on all of these rules and changes? Um, oh, I could plug us, like I say, contact us, but let's come up with some more practical solutions for you. Um, Emma, have you got any thoughts on this, bearing in mind that you're Brussels based? Yeah, so I think it just comes back to a lot of the things that you already talked us through, Claire. Um, keeping on top of what's going on as much as possible, trying to get information from various sources. We do receive a lot of questions um, from small companies planning to launch in Europe uh, for the first time, and we can do like very high level advice on that, just the key things that they need to be aware of, depending on what the product is. Um, those would be my main things. Anything else, Claire? Um, do you know what? I would say never ignore the power of Google in terms of if you genuinely are a very, very small organisation and you need to think about where to start, genuinely getting into Google and getting into searching things can help you start to identify organisations that are relevant to you, blogs that might already be into this. Um, I'd say also the European Commission's website can be a really helpful source of information. They can be very good at categorising things according to technology or chemicals. Um, and that can be a very helpful way to, to start thinking about this. Um, but as Emma said, I do think like reaching out to people who are experts in this area can really help you. Um, a lot of them are always very happy just to have initial conversations just to set you on the right path. Um, I'm conscious that we are coming up against time. There is one, I'm going to ask one question quickly, um, and this might be one for Bill or Rod, so up to you to jump in first. Um, getting international products liability coverage for my goods appears to be a challenge and costly. Any helpful suggestions? You want to talk about Bill? <laughs> Well, it's certainly true that the cost of liability insurance has is, is gone up and the uh, opportunity to increase limits is, is costing more and more. Um, you know, there are certain specialty brokers that can help um, for specialty markets to open up other opportunities. Um, uh, we have a list of those folks. If, if you're interested, I can help offline. But um, the market tends to move as a whole. And certainly, the cost of uh, product liability insurance has um, has become a real issue and very cost prohibitive. Um, you know, usually we find out um, about that on the back end when we're trying to defend a matter and have limited uh, insurance resources um, available. But all of the things that I mentioned are driving um, the the cost of of the insurance. One thing that will happen that I think will result in some softening of the market um, is there will be increased investment with what's going on in the economy um, into the insurance markets which will result in more capacity hopefully then that'll result in lower rates but that's going to take about six to twelve months um, to, to to for that to kick in 
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Bill. I'm conscious that we're running up against time, so I think it just remains to say from all of us at Cooley, thank you to Mondak for hosting this webinar. Thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you found some of what we've said today helpful. And if you do want to continue the conversation, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, Dan, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much, Claire, and thank you to the rest of the panel for joining today. It's been a really insightful session. Um, a thank you to the audience for joining us as well. I hope we can see you again soon. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.